Welcome to uh, Demo 2021, the grand finale. This is literally the world's biggest, boldest and most significant startup competition in procurement, really showcasing the, uh, the, the, the great ideas, the new ideas, the emerging ideas that are disrupting this industry right now all in one place. Now, you're going to be hearing very shortly from no less than 10, yep, 10 big ideas, 10 different founders and startups sharing their ideas really to, as I say, to shake up their industry, but more importantly, to walk away a winner of this competition. So we have got five different categories. We've got 10, 10 pitches, five categories, so we will have five winners by the end of this competition. We will be announcing that tomorrow, so at the end of the day, we'll put all, all, everything all together, and then tomorrow afternoon at some stage, we'll be announcing who walks away as these five lucky, maybe more deserved than lucky winners. But also, there's a little bit of a twist as well. Now, our judges, which I'll uh, talk about a little bit later on, our judges de definitely distinguished within the procurement industry, but naturally you, wherever you are, whether you're at home, whether you're in your office, whether you're at your home office, Office, wherever you are, naturally you are, are knowledgeable and experts in the procurement field as well. So we would like you to let us know who should walk away winner of the audience vote. I'll tell you a little bit more about that a little bit later on, but stick with us and, uh, and you'll hear exactly what it's all about about. Now, again, you know where we are throughout the day. Our The chat has been on fire. If you've just joined us, welcome to Demo 2021. We would love to know where you are. You know we're here in, uh, in the centre of Amsterdam. Again, love to know where you are. So wherever you are, whatever time of the day it is, morning, evening, wherever you are, let us know to really get the feeling of this, uh, of this global competition. Again, we're here in the studio all together, but we would like you to be as, as a part of this as much as possible. So get your comments in, let us know where you are, and uh, let's see who's actually joining us. Right. So, entrepreneurship. Innovation, two words which are naturally closely connected with, with this startup competition, with this day as well. So to give us more of a, of a flavor of really about the status quo of where we are in terms of innovation and uh, entrepreneurship within procurement, next gentleman is about to share his perspective and a little bit more about how he think, sees things unfolding for the future. future. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage from Eco Valdis, Mr. Pierre-Francois Tallet. So I'm Pierre-Francois Tallet, co-founder and co-CEO of Eco Valdis. Really happy to be here today. We are the you know, largest platform for business sustainability ratings. We are helping procurement professionals all over the world understand the environmental and social performance of their business partners. Really glad to be here, you know, introducing Demo 2021 and what the best location to be talking about startups and entrepreneurs than DPW. I think DPW itself is an example of how startups can really transform their industries. I remember the discussions with uh, Matthias three, four years ago in New York. You know, it was a one-man band at that time, and he had big plans. And today, I see really that the digital procurement world is becoming the standard for its industry with thousands of participants today. So kudos to Matthias, and really glad to be, you know, kicking off Demo 2021. So, you know, before introducing the, the demos, I want to just share with you a couple of ideas and why I think it's now one of the best time ever to create a digital procurement startup. If we look at the past 18 months, you know, uh, COVID, you know, has changed a lot of things in our life, but I see three main changes, you know. One is a huge acceleration in digital. You know, many are saying that we've gained 10 years in digital adoption. Second one is the importance of supply chain resilience has raised a lot. You know, even in the, in the news today, we are we keep hearing about the uh, supply chain disruption and the importance of supply chain. And the last one is about sustainability. We'll talk about this one later. But at the intersection of digital and supply chain, you know, procurement tech is getting a lot of uh, you know, momentum in the past 18 months. 
So, you know, a couple of facts or a couple of, uh, you know, uh, wh wh why, why is it happening this way? The first thing is the world of enterprise software is growing like crazy. You know, uh, Ecovadis, we were started uh, 14 years ago now. I think the industry for, you know, enterprise software, enterprise SaaS has been multiplied by 100, you know, since we, since we started. You know, easy access to funding, easy access to development tools, no code, plus digital marketing tools helping you to scale and conferences like uh, DPW, you know, it makes things much easier. And uh, yesterday, I was looking at a report published by uh, Bessemer Venture, you know, a famous VC. They published their Cloud 100 report, looking at the top 100 enterprise software companies. The average valuation of those companies is now $5 billion. You know, that's the average, not the biggest. The average is $5 billion, twice more than last year. And most of those companies are still growing 100% year over year. In the procurement world, you know, a few companies are listed, but if we, if we just look at the one which is listed, Coupa, you know, uh, they're 10 years old, 700 million revenue already, $20 billion market cap. And in their investor presentation last uh, couple of weeks ago, they were saying that with 2,000 customers, they are just covering 5% of the total market. So huge room to grow. And those big procurement platforms are also an opportunity for procurement startups. You know, I think what was pioneered by uh, Salesforce, you know, for sales automation 10 years ago with their App Store and their uh, App Exchange, allowing plenty of uh, innovative marketing solutions to thrive. The same thing is happening in procurement. You know, iValua, Ariba, Coupa, Jagger, they all have huge platforms and they understand that they need to move to an ecosystem app, you know, an App Store strategy. And even specialized providers like Ecovadis, we are smaller, but already close to 1,000 employees globa globally, and we're influ influencing $2.5 trillion of spend every year with our sustainability ratings. We realize that if we want to deliver on our mission, you know, to transform the supply chain to make them more sustainable, we will need also to embed other solutions in our platform. So that's why we are really keen to sponsor Digital Procurement World and demos this year. I think procurement is more ready and more eager than ever to use technology. I remember when we started Ecovadis uh, 14 years ago, uh, the first meeting with CPOs, I was already amazed on how fast and how quick they were to embrace uh, you know, innovation. We were a two-people company, the first meeting with the chief procurement officer of uh, AXA, I remember he told us, go and you know, I'm ready to start, I'm ready to sign up uh, for a pilot after the first meeting. This is happening, I think, even faster now. You know, what's happened in marketing, you know, where we see market, chief marketing officers, they are using 10, 20, 50 solutions in their tech stack. Procurement, they realize that they also need to have a wide range of solutions. You know, they won't have a single platform covering all type of needs. So now is the best time ever for you to start a company, but doesn't mean it's going to be easy. You know, it's going actually to be quite challenging. The landscape is really crowded now. I remember when we started, there were maybe, you know, five big players, 25 emerging players. Now we have hundreds. You know, I was looking at uh, Spend Matters last, uh, uh, you know, the, the famous uh, analyst blog from uh, our friend Jason Bush. Last week, they were referencing 512 procurement service providers for procurement, you know, procurement tech only. So huge, uh, you know, huge number of players. If you want to succeed, I have three advice for you. The first one is you need to be laser focused. Second one, you need to be laser focused. And third one, guess, you need to be laser focused. You need to find one problem and solve it. You just stick to it and provide a global platform for this. When we started Ecovadis, uh, we were focused on providing you know, the largest platform for sustainability ratings for supply chain. We had many temptation over the years to unfocus, start doing other things. We stick to this. And we're really glad today, you know, to be supporting 50,000 businesses across the world and growing uh, very fast. And then last but not least, sustainability. You know, we talked earlier about the those three mega trends who are really, you know, shaping our world in a different way. And sustainability is one of them. I know sustainability is one of the five categories for Demo 2021, but I think across all categories, across all the four categories, whether it's uh, you know, risk, automation, cost savings, sustainability needs to be top of mind if you're an entrepreneur and if you're you know, creating a new solution for the procurement, uh, procurement world. 
We just released, you know, the Eco Valley Sustainable Procurement Barometer. That's a study, you know, interviewing CPOs all over the world. We've been doing it for 14 years. This year, we published it with Stanford University, and you can download it on ecovedis.com. I think for the first year, one of the results we find, one of the findings is CPOs are saying that achieving their company sustainability goals is more important than topics like cost savings. I think really the first year I've, I've seen that, and we've, did, done the, we've done this for 14 years. When we just look at one topic, climate crisis, climate transition, we understand why focus of chief procurement officers is changing. Supply chain are responsible for 80% of global emissions. So it means procurement professionals, you have in your hands 80% of the solutions. You know, transforming your supply chain is key if we want to address the challenge we need to face in the coming 10 years or nine and a half years, actually, when we rise toward the 2030 goal. So for this, we will need two things. We will need courageous CPOs and procurement executives who will drive changes in their organizations, and we will need entrepreneurs bringing innovative solutions. So I'm really glad to be here today because we have both. And I also really think that if we fast forward to 2030, you know, which is the milestone uh, or the deadline set by a scientific, scientific community to really transform our, our economies, in 2030, I think very, I think no one will be remembered for implementing a new cost saving program, a new compliance program. But if you can really, you know, transform your supply chain, if you can really engage thousands of your suppliers into carbon reduction, this will have a massive impact for the next 10 years. So we are counting on you. And now, congratulations to the 75 startups who were shortlisted. You know, the entrepreneurs in each of those companies are really the heroes today. And now, over for the grand finale with the two top startups for each of our five categories. Thank you, and uh, very impatient to see who the winners will be. All companies today have an interest in sustainability. EcoVadis is the world's most trusted provider of business sustainability ratings and is helping companies of all sizes and industries to benchmark and drive improvements. Join the EcoVadis network today and start driving real change for your business, your supply chain, and the world we share. Yeah, Francois, thank you so much. Wonderful. If you've just joined us back, we are right in the middle here of Demo 2021. The, the boldest, the biggest, the most significant pitching competition within the procurement industry. Again, showcasing really this, this the future talent or talent now, which naturally over time will actually blossom into something quite amazing indeed. Right. The first thing we'll do is meet the startups. So we have 10 startups. You can see for yourself there, they are literally from across the globe, four corners of the globe there, lots of different, and you'll hear very shortly, lots of different ideas, very diverse as well. And uh, these are the people which will be sharing their big ideas right now for you again across the globe. Now, let me unfold exactly how this is gonna, gonna go down. So first of all, it's four minutes. All these pitchers have up to four minutes to share their big idea. It doesn't have to be four, it could be less. In fact, most uh, pitches which are less are actually more impactful, but we'll see a little bit later on. Also, once that's finished, we then hand it over to questions from our judges. We have three judges, and they will simply ask the questions perhaps that no one else dares to ask, and also maybe go underneath the bonnet a little bit more to really find out what makes these, these startups tick. So let's meet our judges. We have three judges which will, which will determine the fate of our our pitches uh, a little bit later on. So first of all, we have Global Supplier Management Lead at Roche, Miriam Hartman. Miriam's with us right now. We also have Venture Capital Investor at Axel, Will Sheldon, and also the third of our trio of judges, Head of Digital Procurement at Maersk, 
Jacob, Miriam, Will, and Jacob, well, welcome. You're, I can see you. I can. I can't hear you right now. Hopefully, you can hear me. Yes, we can. Fantastic. Right. I before we begin. Before we begin, I, I would love to know. Also, I'm sure many of us would love to know. What are the kind of things? What are the kind of elements you're looking for that will really really help you take note of some of these big ideas that will really kind of sway your uh, your decision making tell us we'll start with miriam sure i mean obviously it's the content of the idea right um is it also applicable especially for large companies such as wash um, can we use it in our procurement organization that is going to be key but also we're going to look how is the idea being pitched? So, um, is it understandable? Do we uh, do we see how we could bring that forward after that? So, really looking forward to those pitches. Thank you so much for inviting me today. Great, great, great of you to, to join us and to be with us. Will, you're there. I'd love to hear what you think. What are you, what are the kind of things you're looking for? Tell us. Hey there, it's great to be here. So, I think from my perspective as a venture capital investor. Um, I'm particularly looking for companies and startups that we as a judging panel feel have the potential to disrupt an entire industry. We're looking for something innovative, something that has potential globally, and we could imagine becoming the next great procure tech company to really shake up the landscape of existing uh, technology companies in this industry. So super excited to hear the uh, presentations today and good luck to all the participants. Fantastic. Bold statements uh, from that, from, uh, from you, Will. Jacob, love to hear what you think. What's, what's on your mind? What, how are you feeling right now in terms of what's ahead? Well, I'm, I'm feeling good <laughs> and I've been looking forward to this for quite some time. And uh, in terms of what I'm looking for, I think one of the things that's extremely important is that it's, it's problem from the real world that they're addressing with, uh, with their uh, pitches here. So that's one of the things that I'll look for. Is it solving a real problem? Is it... Uh, sort of transformation or new in its approach. Uh, so, so that'll be, is it, is it something that is applicable for us practitioners out there? So that's some of the things that I'll be looking at. Right, so looking for, looking for solutions to, to real, real issues. Right, uh, but, but before we begin, as you know, this is global, naturally. Our chat has been on fire since we began this morning, um, and we, kinda, we, we got a good impression of where people, are, where people are and where people are beaming into. Just let us know where you are right now. Miriam, Will, Jacob, where are you? I'm in Copenhagen. You're in Copenhagen. Will? I'm in London. London, London. and... Zurich, Switzerland. In Switzerland. Fantastic. A lovely, delightful combination. Right. We move on. Stay with us as we move on to, very shortly, to our, to our pitches. Remember, as I said a little bit earlier on, there's a little bit of a twist to this competition. So we have our judges. They will define the destiny of our five winners in, from five categories. But also, naturally, you as procurement professionals, you as experts, people who are knowledgeable, again, in your fields throughout the world, we thought to ourselves, well, why not? Why don't we ask you to decide who one of the winners should actually be. And that's exactly what we're about to do. So right at the end, after our last pitch, after the 10th startup uh, has, has pitched, I'll then hand it over to you to choose your overall winner. This is the audience winner of this competition. We'd love you to be there, so stick with us all the way through and then, uh, and then let us know who you feel should walk away the audience vote winner. So it might be a good idea as we go through, maybe you don't have to, take some notes, just make some, make some kind of mental notes in your, in your mind for when you have to decide who walks away a winner of the audience vote. Right. I think it's almost time to, uh, to move on to our first pitch. But before we do that, just let me tell you, again, there are five different categories. These categories are cost reduction, supplier value, automation and efficiency, risk and resilience, and sustainability. So you can hear five very different categories, very diverse, which has really attracted a very diverse um, set of startups from around the world. Right, ladies and gentlemen, I think you'll agree with me. It's time to start with our very first category.
Right, so we begin with our very first category of the competition. That very simply is cost reduction and savings. Quite explanatory, but literally ideas generating measurable bottom line savings. That's exactly what we're looking for within this category. Right, so we will beam over right now to our first startup, which is called Sastrify. And I believe Sven is there ready and waiting for us. Sven, I can see you looking great. I can't hear you right now. You can hear, I can hear you perfectly as well. How are you feeling? Great. Looking forward to it. Wonderful. Right. What I will do now, I'll just hand you over. Four minutes is yours. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, hello, everyone, all around the world. My name is Sven. I'm co-founder at Sastrify.com. I'm actually based in Munich, um, so I'm probably exactly the triangle of what we just heard from our judges. Let me tell you more about what Sastrify does and how we can help you to save cost, but also time on your software as a service subscriptions. Well, you might have seen this man before, Mark Andreessen from Andreessen Horowitz. Back in 2011, he had the famous quote of software is eating the world. Well, now 10 years have passed and I'd be so keen to say software as a service is now eating the world. That being said, and I think most of you will agree, the SaaS revolution has just started. Cloud is the new normal for most of us. We have 94% adoption. Decentralization of software procurement is a common thing. Most enterprises have more than 300 different applications in different departments on their way. And the rise of artificial intelligence and systems of intelligence is everywhere. What does that mean for us? Well, buying the right stack of software, and that's where all of us as procurement people come into play, is mission critical for the success of our enterprises. But if you look at it, it's just way too complex. There's like more than 300,000 different software suppliers in the world. It's super intransparent. Who of us really knows what is the fair price that you should pay for a software license? And in the end, and that's part of it today, it's just a numerous uh, amount of time and money spent on those software licenses. And Probably most of us still face that with either spreadsheet or quite outdated tools. This results in companies wasting an average 37% of their software spend. And now my question to you is, do you feel the same? We as Sastrify have the mission to provide you with the right set of software, lightning fast and at fair prices to make your company more successful. How do we do that? Sastrify enables what we call an agile software buying process. We help you find the right software supplier, to evaluate them, to ask the right questions, to buy it at the right price, to track it over time, is it really used, and to reevaluate it once it's up for renewal. And we do all of that in one single, the one and only basically Sastrify platform. What have we achieved so far? Well, as you know, we are a startup, so we're quite young. We've actually launched Sastrify only earlier this year. Well, so far, we were already able to deliver a 6.5x ROI on the amount invested with us from our customers. Some of them you might know. For example, Runtastic, for any of you that does sports, does a running app recently acquired by Adidas. What are we building with Sastrify? Well, we are building a consumerized buying experience. We're making buying Salesforce as easy as downloading an app from the App Store. And we do that in a $505 billion enterprise SaaS market. Salesforce handles anything from discovery up to payment and financing. And with our super simple business model, starting at that already $1,000 a month, we achieved almost 1 million in ARR over the past nine months. Who's behind that? Well, Max and I, my co-founder and I have found it before, but now we have a team of 35 astronauts, as we call them. We recently onboarded HV Capital and the founders of Flixbus and Personio as investors. And with that being said, I'd be super happy to get in touch with you. Add me on LinkedIn, drop me an email. Thanks for your attention, and I'm super eager to hear the questions of the judges. Sven. Sassify, superb, wonderful. You, you've kicked it off in the, in the right fashion. Right, we move over now to our judges and let's hear from them about what we've just heard. Over to you. 
Yeah, thank you so much, Svenna, for your presentation. Really exciting. Um, my question for you is, how do you see that your solution could also be applied to other areas than software, potentially? Well, so as we will basically live in a subscription economy, right? So from the Netflix uh, subscription back home to anything in the enterprise world, I think any contract that has some sort of subscription dates, variable setups, I think everything that thinks and works a bit like software as a service, we can also apply that to it. At the same time, for us, I think the most important part is that software is just becoming more and more relevant for enterprises. And that's why we chose to focus on that vertical. Thank you. Ben, thanks for, thanks, the, for, uh, thanks for a very good pitch. Thanks for the presentation. From, from your perspective, what is the really unique thing that you're br bringing with Sastrify? I guess there are a few other solutions that target SaaS app spend and procurement. So where is it that you, you have the edge? Well, um, I, I like to say we are faster and cheaper. Um, and I think those are probably the best, the best arguments. Um, so what makes us unique is um, we really take care of everything from your cloud spend at hyperscalers up to your uh, LinkedIn licenses. That's kind of like a very holistic approach. At the same time, our main value is that we really focus on delivering fast and fair prices. Um, so we can actually also resell licenses ourselves to make it even easier for customers to get to the right set of software really fast. In the end, it's fast and cheap. Um, that's, what we, that's what we aim for. Um, Sven, so buying uh, software as a service obviously is a system uh, investment, but at least when I buy uh, uh, SaaS uh, solutions, I also look very much at the team uh, behind that solution. What is their roadmap? Uh, how ambitious are they? Do we sort of share the same vision about where we want to take this? How does your system uh, take that into account when you sort of make recommendations and the, and the analysis of the need described? Uh, so I think our most important saying is basically, as procurement people, we should ask the right questions at the right time. And that's exactly what we try to build into a platform and where we help our customers um, to make those choices. So basically, if you come and say, okay, for you, it's especially important to meet the team and roadmap behind, then that's something that we can actually build into our discovery process to make that a variable um, that you can choose on. In the end, I think um, what we get a lot from, from our customers as well is that they are looking for solutions that are out there that fit exactly what they need, but also to know what are the two or three maybe competitors that they could also look at, just to have a better feeling when making that decision. But I think making the right choice at the right time, um, that's exactly what we are striving for at the very initial discovery part for, for new software solutions. And Sven, do you see the potential to apply your product to all different sizes of customers? Is this suitable for enterprises all the way down to small businesses? What's your vision there? Very good point. In the end, right now, we're handling customers up to 10,000 people. That's our, our, our largest one at the moment. Um, obviously, there will be a way up market um, to the enterprise segment. I think there's a bunch of stuff um, speaking of uh, compliance and other topics that, especially with regards to uh, GDPR and anything related to um, software as a service and, and software contracts uh, that we can build to help our enterprises. We're actually in the first POC stair. We start somewhere around 100 people plus. That's kind of like, so from 100 to 10,000 people currently is the range. Um, below that, it's more about uh, trying out um, because just the, the lever um, and the total spend is just not big enough. I'm going to stop you there. Guess what? Four minutes can go very quickly indeed. It just has. Sven from Sastrify, thank you so much. And we will, we will see we will see what unfolds perhaps tomorrow with you. Maybe we'll be speaking to you again as a winner. I don't know. Thank you so much, Sven, and, uh, and good luck. Right, we move on now to our next uh, startup. Again, if you just joined us, we're still in the cost reduction and savings category. And what we do now, we, we started in Germany just now. We get on a plane and we go straight across over, over the pond to the US and uh, we meet Suplari. And I think Nikesh is there ready and waiting. Nikesh, you're there? Yeah, I'm here. Wonderful. And when you say I'm here, you, you actually look quite... quite um, 
bright for someone I believe is has just woken up. Am I right? What's the yeah. time over there right now? Where are you exactly? Uh, I think it's uh, four forty-three in the morning. You, you think it's four forty? It's somewhere yeah. early, basically. Don't don't ask me what day it is. Though. Okay, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you've had your coffee and you're ready to go. Nikesh, the floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, so hi, my name is Nikki Parekh, and I'm the CEO of Suplari, and we've built what we call the Spend Intelligence Cloud. Suplari sits on top of all your enterprise data and is constantly and continuously optimizing your costs and your cash flow by providing procurement leaders with a steady stream of recommendations to help you drive strategy. How do we do that? Well, we believe your data should be doing the driving. So we ingest all your data and then we connect that to both predictive insights tied to what we call prescriptive workflows or step-by-step -step best practices to help your whole team capture the value and be held accountable to deliver results. If anything, uh, COVID has shown us that procurement has an extremely strategic role to play um, in terms of driving the success of a company, particularly when there's a systemic uh, shock like COVID. Unfortunately, most procurement leaders are really ill-equipped to drive change at their companies. They have no visibility to their suppliers or their spend. They have extremely limited resources, limited budgets, small teams, especially in a tight labor market, which leads to poor results and almost no influence over spend at larger enterprises. So what does Suplari do and how do we solve that? Think of Suplari as your procurement strategy and execution in a box. We do three things really well. First, we basically ingest all your data, cleanse it and normalize it into a beautiful consumer internet-like experience. And then two, we, we have hundreds of insight apps that are sitting on top of your spend and all your supplier behavior, constantly looking for opportunities to help you manage your spend and your savings and your risk and your compliance. And now more than ever, diversity and sustainability. But most importantly, when Suplari finds an opportunity, it sends an alert to the right person on your team and then guides that person in terms of how to capture the value step-by-step step through prescriptive and customizable best practices. Suplari's so been around since we were founded in 2017. We have an incredible team. Uh, we have a great set of global customers uh, uh, ranging from kind of mid enterprise all the way up to the BTs and a great partner network. But of all the things on this slide, I'm most proud of the reviews we've had from our customers. And we're actually the highest reviewed uh, uh, strategic sourcing application on Gartner. So, uh, if you're interested, please reach out to me on LinkedIn or just shoot me an email at nikesh at I'd love to get in touch with you. And before I end, I want to just give you a quick taste of what Suplari is like. So in front of you now, you're seeing Suplari. Think of it as we've ingested all your data. We're sitting on top of your spend, your POs, your contracts, everything. And then you have hundreds of insight apps that are helping you find the money. And I'm gonna walk you through just a quick day in the life. Now, you got an alert and it's telling you the uh, financial risk uh, of your supplier has increased. You can now see all of the different um, financial, uh, the risk ratings of your suppliers. You've seen that Avnet here has increased in their risk and you can just click through and get all of the data on Avnet. But then you can also see that someone on your team has initiated a case through the Insight with a step-by-step -step process of how to mitigate the risk and look for alternative supply. And uh, you can track all of the comments here in this one case. And now you, as a chief procurement officer, can see all of the cases across your company, track how you're, uh, I'm gonna jump uh, in you're there, achieving Nikesh. your savings goals. I'm going to jump in. And then I'm, gonna, I'm still oh. jumping in. <laughs> okay. Only because of time. Only because we have yep. to make this fair and square. But listen, literally, you were almost on time. So there we are, Nikesh yep. Suplari. No doubt the liveliest man 
for four o'clock in the morning anywhere <laughs> on the planet. I don't know what you're like a little bit later on in the day, but right now, four o'clock, the liveliest man alive. Right, we move over to our judges. Let's hear their perspective about, about what they've just heard. <laughs> Hey, Nikki, thanks so much for the presentation. Thank One you. One topic I was curious to ask, so you're ingesting so much data, you're touching a lot of different systems. Can you talk us through how you implement for a customer? What do you need to integrate with? How does it work? So generally speaking, it takes, uh, for our, our typical customer, it takes about four weeks to get started. Uh, we basically have very much white glove service. So we work with your either the procurement team, the finance team, or the IT team to access the right uh, data feeds out of your ERP, your procure to pay, or your contract management system or other systems. And then we basically create either an integration, a data extract, or we'll work with you on a manual upload. As you can imagine, uh, enterprises have a wide variety of different systems, and we've actually invested a significant amount in the data ingest to make it as easy as possible on our customers. Two, two quick questions uh, from my side. First of all, thanks a lot for, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Love it that you do a demo as well. Uh, the first thing is really the intelligence of your solution. That's all these insight or action triggers. How do you continuously develop those and ensure they're relevant for real practitioners? That's one. Yep. And then the second thing is, how do you see the end game? Because if you can identify the actions, why can't you also just trigger the solution and then have a, a, the, the system automatically do something about it, whether it's a supplier risk or a renegotiation, whatever it is? Yep. So uh, your first question, what was the first question? That was on the action triggers. How do you oh, ensure right. they're relevant and how do you develop yep. new ones? So part of our core technology is what we call our um, insight, gen, uh, or insight library. So as we develop, we believe our core intellectual property is actually the insights. So as we develop uh, insights for customers or customers uh, develop insights, these blueprints keep getting added back into the library. So the library is actually growing exponentially to continuously target more and more questions or hard problems that customers are developing. And customers can develop their own and choose to contribute those to the library. So the library grows dramatically every year. And our, our customer success team has a process where we go through um, and actually talk to our customers to understand what their strategic problems are, and then we can configure those insights to best solve those problems for the customer. Um, and then the end game is actually, like you said, automation back into those systems in terms of I optimizing um, the, the recommendations, and then once we're confident, actually automating the actions. We'll start with simple actions uh, initially, and then make them more and more advanced through sourcing systems uh, in the future. Thank you very much. Maybe as a follow-up question to what you just described, these libraries, are they being created across different customers or focused on one particular customer and you built library um, for them specifically? So the library, the library is across all of our customers, but then we are breaking them down into kind of best practices by industry. So we have retail customers and telecom customers, but then many, uh, many insights are, can be applied across all customers. So process related insights, many spend and savings related insights to based on the category. So either based on industries or categories, we can now group uh, insights and then deliver them to customers depending on the problems they're trying to solve. Thank you. And you've addressed my next question already a little I, bit. What categories are you covering? I, actually, Miriam, I don't think we've actually got enough time for that. Time is running out. Again, four minutes goes so quickly, doesn't it? Maybe that's a question for, for Nikesh a little bit later on. Nikesh, thank you so much for, for getting up so early, first of all, and sharing <laughs> no your problem. big idea. I guess, I guess you're going to go back to bed right now, right? I'm going to try to, Peter. <laughs> well, good night.
Good night, Nikesh. Right. Thank you so Thank much. You. Let's see what happens tomorrow. So there we have it. We have our first two startups. These were actually in the cost reduction and savings category. Again, one of these, Sven or Nikesh, will walk away a winner tomorrow. We'll find out, find out about that tomorrow. Again, you, wherever you are at home, in your office, at your home office, wherever you are, on the go, if you maybe want to put down your comments, who you think should win perhaps, or maybe just to maybe even challenge some of the startups with some of their ideas. Ladies and gentlemen, it's now time to move on to our next category. Right, simply two words. Two words, supplier value. This is all about unlocking value, value from suppliers to really improve performance, quality, innovation and collaboration. I'm excited as much as you are really to hear what these uh, startups really have to offer. So what we'll do now is we will go. So we were in America just then, four o'clock in the morning in the time zone over there. We come back across the pond, back to Europe over to Germany. I believe right now we have Gregor ready and waiting from Scout B. Gregor, you're there? Hi, Peter. Yes, I am. I can see you. I can hear you beautifully as well. You look like you're ready. It's not four o'clock in the morning there. We're pretty much on the same time zone, I imagine. Is that right? Yeah. Definitely a benefit. Yes, same okay. time zone. Okay. Gregor, take it away. Four minutes is yours. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hi everyone, Gregor from Scoutby, CEO and founder and father of a beautiful son since 10 days. Um, yeah, Scoutby was founded in 2015. We had the first product to market in 2017, 140 employees, roughly $80 million in funding. <clears throat> and today I'm going to show you how we are getting your supplier data right and your supplier search fast. So what did other users or customers achieve with Scoutby? So we had, for example, Unilever to save tens of millions of euros. Siemens, we actually gave very deep category and market insights. And for Audi, we structured data across different ERP systems and richer with external data, so they always had a good insight within the internal supply chain. How do we do that? Well, always five steps. We come in together with you, cleansing and structuring your data. Then we enrich it. Internal and external data point, whatever data point you're asking for that is driving value. And then we help you to analyze and automate and later on to collaborate with internal and external stakeholders to in the end help you to discover any supplier around the globe with speed and ease. And why is that so important? Well, because procurement is important. We hear a lot about resilience, but let's not think about resilience about uh, disaster response because procurement is under constant pressure, competition, competition that is faster, cheaper, or more sustainable. So when procurement is actually actually resilient, it has to stay competitive. And what does it mean? They have to be successful. And what is creating success? Well, creating the right strategy and executing on it. But if you take a look at the procurement life cycle, most of the innovations are actually going into things like contract management, uh, payment automation, so actually process optimization downstream. Upstream, the real value, the, the things where you create choice is uh, usually untapped. And that's where the value is hidden, strategic analytics and strategic sourcing. And if you zoom in a little, that's where Scalpy is helping. That's where we help you to structure your data, identify sourcing projects, identify the right suppliers, and then even end, in the end, select them. What's the status quo? Well, not on the left side, right? So often negotiations and procurement are prepared in Excel sheets. And if you're talking about status quo regarding supplier scouting, it's also very, very analog. We are talking about Excel, Google trade shows, phone and email, very intransparent process that in the end ends up in a supplier record and supplier information management, and nobody knows how and why. And those are the two fundamental challenges for strategic sourcing, a very bad data foundation and a slow and manual reactive supplier search that is leaving procurement out and not in the driver's seat. And that's where Scout becomes in. We're addressing that. Fast and smart supply insights, your secure data foundation with very clean, deep, and fast searchable data, enriched with external and internal data. And then combined with fast and smart supply discovery, so you can access any supplier anywhere at any time with speed and ease. And how do we do that? Well, we make sense out of global supplier data spaghetti. We download the internet 180 million domains every month. 
and then we bring this to you. So you can build something like that. You can screen 10,000 suppliers and reach 100 profiles on about 50 potential candidates. You can collect detailed RFI feedback from all of them and even sign NDAs. And all the time you have to put in is 180 minutes. And that's a strong offer to your internal organization. And that's where it becomes strategically relevant. Like in this case, where the procurement team find a better procurement process and manufacturing process, saving $20 million, 80% in CO2, and even have a better quality in place. So Scalpy helps you getting end to end strategic sourcing right by helping you to create state-of-the-art supplier data foundation and cracking the code of identifying relevant suppliers anywhere at any time. So you always have the right options at hand. Thanks for listening. And if you want to speak, let's talk, dpw at scalpy.com. Beautiful. Let's talk. Wonderful. Right. So, how do you think you did? Well, no, don't answer that. Don't answer that. Maybe later on. Okay, let's move over now to our judges, our jury members. And let's again, let's hear some of the questions they want to put forward to you. Sure. You want to start, Miriam? Or... No, okay, let, let me start. So, <laughs> sure. thanks again for a good pitch. Uh, um, in terms of your supplier scouting, do you do you have a do you have a split on how much is truly automated versus how much is you can say supported uh, backend from uh, from the scout me team, and could you point at industry geographies where you don't think your coverage is perfect today? Um, yeah, let's start with the last question. <clears throat> so anywhere where we have oligopolies or almost monopolies, scout is not of big help. Uh, let's talk about defense, for example, or partially also aerospace. <clears throat> but other than that, uh, we are very industry agnostic. And you see that also with the logos at the bottom here of that page. Regarding automation and uh, real um, uh, uh, white glove service support, that depends a little bit on the customer. So in the end, we can literally automate the whole process of providing a list of potential suppliers. But usually the procurement doesn't want then to go uh, through a list of 1,000 candidates. So we also have services that help them to pre-select suppliers. And we, of course, then in the end, when we talk about uh, onboarding suppliers, uh, sometimes our email chain is not enough. So we actually have also supplier uh, engagement teams across the globe that makes sure also that the right suppliers then also engage on the platform. But we, of course, do that uh, with purpose uh, in the sense every supplier that is coming on the system and is providing more information, gives us more data, and makes us, yeah, it makes our IP even stronger on top of that. Thanks, Gregor, for the uh, presentation. Can you share a bit more about um, where, where Scoutbee is heading? If you fast forward three or five years, what are some of the extra things that you'll be bringing to this platform that you've developed? Yeah, we really want to uh, le uh, leverage upstream, so to get strategic sourcing right. And strategic sourcing for us is data, insight, foresight, action. And we want to build out um, a system that can support strategic sourcing in any of those areas. And if we dump it down now for procurement, strategic sourcing is pretty much that, right? It's, it's data and insights to identify where do I have to take action, and it's taking actions in the sense of interacting with an existing supplier or finding a new supplier. So we want to cover all of that in the future. I'm heading to a similar direction. Um, so with the breadth of data that you're gathering and also analyzing, um, what areas do you see where you could uh, maybe build additional solutions based on that information that you're gathering um, going forward? Uh, to be frank, I think actually almost any action within procurement, um, uh, let's talk about risk. Um, if you, Of course, you can measure risk, but in the end, you have to take action and find, for example, a turn supplier. Let's talk about sustainability or resilience or innovation. In the end, it comes down that you have the right supplier pool and the right data at hand. So only if, if you have a choice, you can actually make sustainability happen and not only measure, measure it. I had a talk with um, Alex Tamaro from Unilever just before, where she mentioned exactly that. You cannot uh, make sustainability count if you only have two suppliers at hand. You need at least four or five because as the... Uh, the profit margin will always win. So in the end, it's, it's really all of the areas regarding strategic sourcing, speaking about innovation, resilience, sustainability, and in the end, profitability. We've got 30 seconds, 30 seconds on the clock. Just a quick one then. Uh, do you see, um, do you see Scoutbee supporting the entire sourcing process, including uh, bid collection and uh, facilitation back and forth uh, on that process? 
No, we definitely um, stop actually uh, downstream. So we see actually uh, ourselves uh, on, a, on a strategic value generation. Uh, we can connect with any system that is uh, beneficial. We also don't have to run the RFX process on our system. Um, it really depends. You want to be integrated. In I'm going to jump in. There we are. Don't, I didn't need to jump in. There we are. Gregor, thank mm -hmm. you so much. Scout B, we'll, you, we'll hear the destiny of Scout B in this competition tomorrow. Thank you so much, Gregor. And uh, goodbye, Germany. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> right, we move on. As you can, I, I know what you're thinking at home or in your office or in your home office, wherever you are. You're thinking, this is tough. This is really tough to decide who in each category should actually go forward as a winner. And you can imagine to decide the overall winner for, for the vote for you as an audience is probably even tougher. I don't know. Maybe you already have your winner. Let us know, perhaps. Let us know your comments, what you think, your perspective, even if you want to challenge some of the startups and their ideas on what they're actually sharing. Right, we move on. Again, if you've just joined us, we are still here in the supplier value category of Demo 2021, the biggest, the boldest, and most significant startup pitch competition on the planet. We were in, we started in Germany, then we went over to the US. We came back to Germany just now. Guess where we're going now? That's right. To the US once again. It's exhausting. It's exhausting for me just thinking about that. But we move over right now, and I believe I can see right in front of me Anne Sophia Ravakan, ready and waiting. I think I can hear you. We can hear you okay? Yeah. Fantastic. Hi. Wonderful. Sounding good. Looking great. I'm intrigued as much as everyone else to hear your pitch. Four minutes is yours. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Hello from San San Francisco. Uh, my name is Anne-Sophie. I'm the CEO of Ravacan. And I would like to start with a little story, something that really happened to me when I was global commodity manager at Fitbit. So the supply and sourcing teams were working hard towards a product launch planned for Mother's Day. Uh, we were quite excited because the product was innovative, um, but one day we found out that one supplier would be late. They had actually failed to place orders for a long lead time component. Um, and we were learning that too late, meaning that now the whole product launch was in jeopardy. And uh, how did we solve this? Well, uh, with a lot of work, um, we looked for alternative sources. And, um, but at the end of the day, we uh, end up, ended up uh, eroding our margins, right? Uh, with higher unit costs, expedite fees, and extra time. And this happens every day in the world of manufacturing, with a global supply chain struggling to share critical information, such as inventory levels, uh, lead times, prices, and so on. And why is that? Well, because the state of the art, like email and Excel, um, those tools are not collaborative, and they just don't cut it. And they are not powerful enough for what we need to achieve. So this is why we created Ravacan. And, um, I want to show you how now we are helping more than 200 companies achieve supply chain alignment. So we've created the platform, a cloud platform that connects buyers, suppliers, and contract manufacturers. They collaborate uh, in real time and exchange information such as um, prices, lead time, capacity. So for example, the buyer will uh, synchronize the bill of materials and track changes so they can focus on sourcing new parts. Um, the system automatically generates um, a forecast as well that are shared with suppliers um, and uh, with the relevant suppliers following the allocation you specify. You can schedule your own as well regular price update requests and follow on savings in the powerful CBOM uh, or costed bomb uh, view. Um, and then you can track as well the level of wear and tear of supplier tooling and, uh, and see where the bottlenecks are. On top of that, Ravacan uh, creates automatic alerts, reminders, and allows you to create your own dashboards for optimum um, reporting to the management. So now let me give you an example of one of our earliest um, customers, Molecule. They are a tech company. They make high-tech air purifiers that destroy viruses and pollutants, meaning that in 2020, their business was booming um, with the wildfire and the pandemic. Um, they wanted to launch new product lines and go international uh, with their product, but with only a small sourcing teams, they really needed a powerful solution to scale their operations. And using Ravacan, the, the results were beyond expectations. 
not only they were more productive and uh, they achieved more, but as well, they managed to save more money and uh, exceed their saving targets. But the coolest thing, I think, is uh, the fact that um, 100% of their suppliers were on board. They were so happy to use this solution because not only they make them more productive, but as well, they, um, they get more insights from their customers. So behind Ravacan, there's a team of industry experts and uh, technology experts as well. And we have this dream to revolutionize how manufacturers uh, work together. So I invite you to uh, join um, the enterprises and mid-sized companies that are already working on Ravacan and achieve a supply chain alignment. Thank you. As you said, and Sophia, as you said, thank you. It was right on zero. So perfect timing. Congratulations. Right. And also, again, thank congratulations for getting up so early. I guess it's pretty early there as well. What time is it? Yeah, it's uh, 5, 5 a.m. Yeah. 5 a.m. <laughs> Sounding great for someone at 5 a.m. Right, again, let's move over to our jury members and hear how they felt about your pitch. Yeah, thank you so much for getting up so early and for your presentation. Really interesting. My question for you would be, um, how does your solution work? Is it a punch-out solution or standalone, or does it need to be integrated, or can it be integrated in existing solutions? Yeah, so we integrate with PLM Software Arena Solutions. That's the first uh, uh, big integration that we launched. Um, but you can import your bill of materials from um, you know, any software with a CSV upload. Then the next step for us is to integrate to SAP. That is uh, on our roadmap and coming up soon. Thank you. How do you think about the ROI of your solution, and Sophie? Clearly, it's interesting to bring these manufacturers together. You told us this story of how things work, but could, do, do you quantify the value that you bring to your customers? Yes. Well, um, you have those hard savings. Um, so what happened, uh, especially with Molecule at the beginning, is that they, uh, they were more productive. That's what I mentioned. So we can quantify the hard savings they had by just you know, saving some headcounts. And then there are the, the savings on the, um, on the parts themselves or the prices. Because with this um, demand forecast, what we do is we help the customer aggregate all the demands of all the part numbers that are used in different uh, product lines. And so then we share those demands with the suppliers so they can see, OK, well, no, the business is, is bigger than what I thought and, um, and give discounts. Um, then as well, we can quantify. Um, we launched with a multinational, our tooling, um, tooling management software. And so what happens is that they can quantify the fact that they are uh, not having tool breaks and disruptions anymore um, due to uh, poor maintenance, for example. So f first of all, um... I think if there was a price for good timing, you would win it, no doubt, with the problem that you're addressing, which I think everybody is facing right now. Is, but, but one thing is the sort of immediate problems that you help address with your clients. What about that data foundation that you aggregate as you onboard more and more companies, more and more uh, processes, uh, suppliers to the platform? What is your plan or what is the vision for, for this? Um, what, do you, what are you going to do with, with all that data? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, like, this is a very good question. Um, we are really starting with the foundations that will make sure that we can use um, this data for uh, more insights. So essentially what I'm saying is that we want to use, you know, machine learning and AI to identify trends, to make uh, good recommendations. And we are already doing it because this week we launched our first AI application uh, when we... Uh, do our recommendations for um, for cleaning up data um, uh, from our customers, but um, obviously our first target is to make our you know users more productive, achieve more, um, generate savings, and when we have um, a critical mass, I would say we can start you know really leveraging and do benchmarking. Uh, but for now, we just want to uh, get the formula right, which is to expand the network and um, and to um, to prove the value of the, the software. When will you be there? Is that one year or three years down the line? Yeah, I think it's uh, in uh, one year to two years, yes. Thanks.
20 seconds, 20 seconds on the clock. One last quick question and answer, maybe. What keeps you up at night right now, Anne-Sophie? What's the biggest challenge you're facing? Hmm, accelerating the sales cycles of uh, with these uh, big enterprises, yeah. <laughs> Beautiful quick question and a beautiful answer as well. And Sophia, thank you so much. Again, I will thank say you. the same thing to you as I said to Nikesh. Sleep well. Good night. Right. Where, however you're going to spend the day right now, so early in the morning. Right. So we already have gone through, unfolded two different categories, cost reduction and savings, and now supplier value. And now, as you can imagine, it's time to move on to the third category. Right, this category, again, two words, automation and efficiency. Automation and efficiency, tech that, that simply automates the, the procurement process and manual re repetitive tasks to boost productivity. Right, I'm intrigued, again, as much as you are, really, to, to hear what these, uh, these ideas and concepts really have to offer. Again, so Germany, uh, USA, um, Europe, Germany, back to the USA, San Francisco, just now with Anne-Sophia. We're coming back over to Europe, to a country that starts with an E, ends in an A, that's right, Estonia. We are over to Estonia. You're with us right now. I believe Kasper is, is ready and waiting. Are you there, Kasper? Yes. Hi, everyone. Fantastic. Um, it's not early in the morning. You've had your coffee already. You've had time to, to relax and prepare. And uh, we would love to hear what you're about to share. So four minutes, Kasper, is yours. Hi, uh, my name is Kasper. I'm the co-founder of Pactum. And as many of you know in the industry, majority of your time goes to 20% of your suppliers, which are the most important ones. But 80% is left unmanaged because it just takes too much resources and time of yours. And it's quite obvious because if you have tens of thousands of suppliers who need hundreds of thousands of negotiations annually, you end up with millions of contract variations. For these multidimensional calculations, they're just too difficult for our human brains. Like our brains are not meant for these things. And this means you're leaving money on a table. And I bet this is right now happening in your organization. That's why we launched Pactum. First ever solution for fully automated end-to-end -end negotiation process to unlock that hidden value. I'll show you how it works with our clients like Walmart and many other Fortune 500s, how we create this bottom line profits to them. I'll screen share now. As a supplier, you receive an email. That email has a link and directs you to our supplier portal. And here you have a conversation with the AI that represents your company. So, like a real conversation and negotiation, we'll try to expand the pie, we'll try to reach an agreement. I can first of all here in, in this example list my preferences, how I would like to increase our business. And, and then we can do offers, we can do counter offers here, we can see some payment terms, options, and etc. The magic behind this is that our AI knows the values of those terms for you. So it's able to make these complicated trade-offs automatically. Once we reach an agreement, both supplier and you will receive an email to DocuSign the contract. Once the signature is there, we update automatically your systems. Let's continue with the screen share. Once the systems have been updated, this is the view what you see. As a client, you see list of suppliers. What's the negotiation phase? Where are they? What's the percentage improvement? And what it means in dollars? How much net value we have generated? But usually our clients wake up in the morning and they come to their dashboard view. And this is put together with your category managers to support your KPIs. It shows here the funnel of signed deals, it shows the conversion through time and, uh, and improvement through time, and you can see each patch is improving through time because the AI is learning through data. But most importantly, you're interested on the bottom line profit. And in this example, we have generated $193 million pure profit annually. Thank you for screen sharing. I'd like, just like to conclude that on average, we improved the contract value by 4.2%. And for low margin businesses, this could be like 40 to 50% of extra profitability per supplier. 
So Factum is not only about automation and efficiency gains. It's about creating new net value on autopilot. This year, we raised Series A of $11 million, led by Atomico. And together with that, we launched a full product portfolio across industries and use cases. So Pactum is doing negotiations in PO negotiations, uh, bidding negotiations, item level negotiations, merchandising negotiations, working capital negotiations, freight negotiations, etc. And I have to say proudly that we have succeeded with all of them. So now that you learned about how Pactum impacts the bottom line, you're interested to learn more. Please reach me out on LinkedIn, write me directly, and let's start the conversation. Thank you. Let's start the conversation. Hopefully, a conversation will start. But the next conversation we're going to hear now is literally from the jury members unpacking a little bit more about what you've just shared. Over to you, jury members. Thanks, Casper, for that presentation. Uh, can you share a bit more about how a new customer gets up and running with Pactum? What do you need to integrate with, or, and how does the implementation work for this solution that you've developed? Yes, a very good question. Thank you. So usually our clients prefer to start with proof of concept to see whether, because it's quite hard to believe it actually works. So the proof of concept usually is uh, two months for three weeks. We understand what is the negotiation space, what terms we negotiate and what are the values of those. Next three weeks, we set it up to yourself. And then we have three weeks or four weeks usually of the pilot. Usually during the pilot, we don't do much automation. But then after the pilot, it's in that sense pretty simple that the system needs quite few terms like payment terms or some values or some uh, uh, existing rates. We get those whether in uh, financial systems or through SAP Ariba or through Coupa, through APIs. Once we have created new contract, we just push them back via API call. Thanks, Kasper, for an intriguing uh, presentation. Um, would you describe Pactum as being a service company or a data company, if we look at it sort of long term? And secondly, uh, just a quick follow up. When will you see the first algorithms done on the supplier side? There's no need to only automate one side of the negotiation. Oh, I love your questions. So first of all, we have to meet our clients needs because our clients are the largest in the world. And usually, you as large companies, you want both, you want services, but eventually in long run, of course, it's data-driven decisions. Like imagine if you can do thousands of similar negotiations that we do today, how each next negotiation can improve based on the previous results. And of course, that has made us already a unique player because there are no other softwares like that. So uh, hard to compete. But uh, what was the what was the second question? Sorry, I totally forgot. When will we see the first uh, oh. algorithm or bot on the supplier side? Yes. So we are already working with that with one one of our customers because, uh, to be honest, it's very true. If there are very transactional negotiations happening in every day, whether it's some item level uh, transactions or freight transactions, and you need to exchange information every day, whether you want this or not, or what are the rates. Then on the other side, it's very easy to build APIs next to us because our software is API first. So APIs are already there so that APIs can communicate. And then the user interface and language is not relevant anymore. So it really depends on the use case. In conclusion, uh, many use cases happen only once per year, these negotiations. And then suppliers want to have longer conversations. They want to invest their time in there to find ways how to increase their business. And then API doesn't work. Thanks. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. How does your commercial model look like? Do you judge by sourcing event or is it more value-based deals that you create? Yes. Again, thank you. Uh, this is, of course, I would like to have an easy answer, but I don't. Because what we have experienced, again, that each of you want to have different pricings and we like to meet your needs. All in all, we create so much value that we have always found ways how to share that revenue. Our best option, of course, would be to have a gain share model so that if we create $1,000, we take that cut. And if we create $1 million, we take the exact same percentage. And it makes sense because we have shared values. But in many cases, 
this is not desired, and then we agree on license fees uh, per negotiation also. Casper, thank you so much. Pactum, we will hear tomorrow the, uh, the destiny of, uh, of Pactum in this competition anyway. So thank you so much and, uh, and good luck. Thank right, you. again, if you've just joined us, remember this is the Demo 2021 uh, Startup Pitching Competition, biggest, boldest. I always say that, the biggest, the boldest, and the most significant, because it's true, most significant startup competition within the procurement industry. And we right now are on the third category, which is automation and efficiency. Automation and efficiency. We've just heard from Casper in Estonia with Pactum. We now move once again across we get on a plane or, or a boat or or however we're going to get there but we, we're going to Mexico we're going to Mexico right now because I believe Sergio is there hello Sergio all the way over there Mexico how are you doing very good and you fantastic you sound great you're looking great and I, I'm, you. I'm sure you I've got the feeling you're going to have a great pitch as well let's see over to you four minutes is yours excellent thank you very much guys so um just to confirm that you're seeing my, 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 my screen now, my name is Sergio. I'm a co-founder and CEO of JADU, and we help companies, especially global companies, digitize the supply chain gap that they have with their SME vendors. And basically, the reason why we do this is because we understand very well that global companies are investing tons of money in procurement digitization, especially in, in, in companies from North America and Western Europe. However, when we're speaking about uh, automating end-to-end -end supply chains, when you have SME suppliers, it's very difficult because SME suppliers are not digitized. Around 10% of them are digitized in emerging markets, what makes it like, super complex for companies to be able to uh, fully automate these processes, making companies waste more than $100 billion each year in enterprise software and uh, model workforce that is basically like <laughs> helping to uh, have all the all like uh, these kind of solutions that end up having a mix of different uh, uh, software that is like, interacting with different suppliers, different kind of documents, payments, bank accounts, etc. And we believe there is a better way of doing it, and that's why we have created JDU. It's an streamlined solution that interfaces between your global company, your local SME, and the local financial services providers, allowing companies to have full collaboration with both internal and external. external uh, 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 stakeholders workflow automation creation of, uh, of the of, uh, 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 automated creation of vendor portals and i want to rematch accounts payable automation and even access to supply chain financing opportunities the way this works is basically jdu becomes an interface between your local erp or procurement suite and then on top of that we are adding different kind of onboarding and risk analysis allowed to look at compliance integrations marketplace with different kind of solutions of uh, the, the most used accounting software or ERPs that are used by, by the SMEs, uh, allowing for different local B2B payments as well as access to different SMB lenders and factory. We know this is working well because we're, we're serving more than 1,000 customers across five countries and currently making more than $6 million in ARR. This represents more than four times growth in the last 12 months. Uh, and we're connecting more than 70,000 SMBs in the network of these uh, more than 1,000 customers. The way this has been growing over the last months is quite uh, impressive because uh, we've, we've been able to increase, let's say, the, the growth since our series A from, let's say, having just between 50 to 60 new companies added per month to more than 200 added per month. And just in the last week, we were able to add more than 100 companies in, in, in a single week, where it's going to help us uh, reach uh, uh, the, the end of the year with above $6 million in ARR. And more, and more than $500 million in total payment volume of process payments in the accounts payable perspective. The, uh, the, the, the best of this is that is this is a risk-free opportunity for large global companies, since basically they are right now uh, able to digitize their SMBs without having to pay a penny for, 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 for this. What this means is that we're able to monetize the, the, the SMBs by selling them SaaS for payables and receivables automation, credit management and collections automation, as well as the opportunity of launching corporate uh, purchasing cards and cash management technology. This is basically the way that we're able to grow, grow so fast because the business model is super innovative and, and not only we're able to monetize the SaaS subscriptions, but also the different payment volume that, 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 that we're adding, as well as the invoice financing opportunities. We have a great team that combines securities in procurement, B2B payments, uh, uh, enterprise sales, as well as to the support from great investors, global investors have a strong focus in emerging markets like SoftBank, Monashis, Base10, and Live Global Partners that basically were the funds that participated on our Series A. 
Uh, and that has helped us uh, bring a great team of procurement professionals that are transforming the way companies are transacting and, and the way companies are interacting between uh, global multinational companies and local SMBs. My name is Sergio, and we're doing procurement on autopilot. Sergio, thank you so much. All the way over there in Mexico, again, an early riser, as if you were, as if you'd already been awake for, for hours already. You guys are more, you, you guys are more freshened up than we are over here in Europe. Right, let's move over to our, our judges and hear how they feel about what they've just heard. Thanks for the presentation. Um, can you share a bit more about in the coming years how you plan to develop the platform that you've already started to build here? What is the vision for, for the business going forward? Okay, so first of all, the most important is that we believe this is something that can be applied in all the global south. The first step is Mexico and Spanish speaking Latin, where we are where, where we are already having very strong partnerships with, now, with large companies, especially on the CPG category. Uh, basically, uh, with, with a very strong activity in Mexico, Colombia, Peru. And we believe that it's going to be equally difficult to launch the product or to continue growing in Brazil than to go into Africa or to Middle East or to Southeast Asia. So basically, right now, the, the, the main opportunity is to be a layer of engagement and automation that is sitting on top of the system of record that companies are already are, 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 are using globally and use the large CPG companies as a backbone to continue expanding and, in the end, create a network of B2B payments that becomes the standard of the ways companies are exchanging money uh, in, in emerging markets and, in the, in the future, also provide access to fair financial services for all the SMEs. We believe that today, uh, when, we're, when we're speaking to access to working capital, especially SMEs in, in emerging markets, have a very uh, like a, 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 a unfair position because they end up paying up to, up to seven percent uh, in, in waste factoring per month, when we know that the cost of capital in developed markets is, in some cases, even less than one percent per month. So we believe there is a huge arbitrage opportunity, if you want to call it that way to create a decentralized finance network in which we allow lenders in, in, in developed markets participate in e-waste financing in the global south. So thanks for thanks for a good presentation. Um, did, I, did I understand correct that you're charging sort of both sides of the network? So of course there's a SAS fee, but you also uh, uh, produce services for the participating uh, vendors. Um, I think yeah. others have tried and, and failed that before some of the larger players. But what's your what's your view on that commercial model and the long term sort of sustainability uh, of that? Is it the vision to continue to charge both sides, or will you go mainly in one or or the other uh, direction? The vision is to be the platform. We are not aiming to do everything. The way the reason why we're going to succeed is because we let everyone play. So something that other players have tried to do, especially when it comes to uh, enabling B2B payments or, or invoice financing, is that they want to be the direct lenders, they want to be the B2B payment providers, and basically what we do is we connect with the local payments and with local financial services ecosystem. Basically, we provide access to banks to create deposit accounts uh, in each of the markets where we're partnering, and we give access to third-party lenders the possibility of participating in the invoice financing. If we're basically like trying to do everything at the same time, it will be, like, of course, super difficult. And basically, the fact that we're enabling traditional financial service providers uh, participate in this network and on this platform of opportunities is basically what is going to help us win. And then uh, regarding the features, our focus is mainly like uh, making sure that the SMEs are having a product that is super sticky, that is really like, helping them uh, automate their both procurement accounts payable and accounts receivable because it is it, 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 not only the interaction that they're having with the procurement side on the on, on the large uh, companies. And basically, on the large company side, is mainly the integration. We're not competing against the SAPs or the Rivas or the Coupas. So in, in the end, we're providing a simpler interface because what they have realized so far is that SMEs only enter vendor portals to send invoices to the large corporate players, but they don't use that vendor portal to do anything else than that. What we are basically trying to do is to provide an interface where SMEs are not only sending invoices to the large corporate partners, but they are also like managing order cash flow and managing their own payables and their own receivables. That's the main objective. That's the main objective. And the main objective to stay on time. You've you've done that mission. <laughs> Sergio, thank you so much. Good luck. We say goodbye to Mexico. And maybe we'll go back to Mexico tomorrow. Maybe you'll end up one Please. of the winners. <laughs> thank you so much. Right.
Listen, as you can hear, it's, it's really difficult. I can, you can imagine if you were in the shoes of the jury members deciding who should walk away a winner of each of those categories, I'm sure it would be a tough call. But guess what? We're actually going to ask you to do that because, again, we want you to, at the end of this, at the end of this pitching competition, to give us your vote. You will be asked to choose one overall winner of this competition. It's a tough call, so many great ideas, diverse, diverse ideas, and all the ideas, as you can imagine, and as you can hear, really merit and deserve to be in this final. Right, now, here's the thing. H how would you like to have a DJ in your living room. How, how would that feel? Well, guess what? That's what it feels like right here. We've already heard from her a little bit earlier in the day, in, in the morning. We've already heard from her in the afternoon, and we're about to do the same right now because we're going to go for a short, uh, short break, a short um, um, drink break, a coffee break, bathroom break, whatever break you want to call it. We're going to do that right now. And uh, join us back here for more big ideas at Demo 2021 right here in Amsterdam.
We are back. Now, in this break, I, I uh, did a few things, went to the bathroom, uh, had a quick drink of water, had something to eat, but also naturally had a look at the, at the chat, which is simply on fire since we've started Demo 2021. And we've got lots of things going on there, lots of questions, clearly lots of intrigue into, into all of the startups, in fact. Really difficult going by your questions to decide who perhaps should go forward as a winner. We've also got uh, um, somebody wrote, actually, can we vote for the DJ? Can we vote for the DJ to win? We can. We can pop that in there. <laughs> so the demo, the, uh, demo 2021 uh, procurement startup pitching competition is won by a DJ. Maybe we'll sit, perhaps we'll do that next year. We've also also on there um, uh, a gentleman called Mark Pereira said, I love Peter Hopwood. That's me, Mark. I love you as well. So there's a, you can see things are evolving, things develop. There's a bromance going on here right now during this pitch competition. Right. <laughs> we move on now to our next category, and that is... Here it comes, the buffer. Yep. Yeah, as you, can, as you can hear, our technical guys at the back working all day long, very hard, doing a fan, absolutely fantastic job. Again, maybe got, got a bit carried away with, with the DJ uh, playing the music as well. Anyway, so this, this category here, the fourth category, this is all about risk and resilience. Really ideas that, that manage and reduce risk, building robust supply chains for, uh, for that disruption for when it hits. Right. We've been literally around the world, back and forward, back and forward like a yo-yo, but we're right now back to a place, a place which I know very well, the UK. So we go over to Ashley. Ashley, you're, you're there. Hi, Ashley. I'm here. Can you hear me loud and clear? Perfectly. We can see you loud and clear as well. Where are you in the UK right now? I'm in London right now. London right now, ready and waiting. Not so sunny London. Not so, well, listen, it's not so sunny here either, but hopefully with the DJ and with everything that's been going on, we've brightened your day up as you're about to brighten our day as well. Ashley, four minutes is yours. Hello, everyone. My name's Ashley, and I want to talk to you, particularly to procurement and supply chain leaders, about solving supply chain risk management challenge that I know that you and your counterparts are facing, no matter what country or industry you are in right now. If you're responsible for managing supply chain risk in your supply chain, I know that 60% of you of you and your organizations have already onboarded a supplier that has gone on to be the cause of a supply chain incident. And the other 40% of you aren't confident that you won't be the victim of a supply chain incident in the near future. Now, I also know that all recent data protection, business resilience, ESG, and cybersecurity regulations have included specific obligations for your organizations to actively manage supply chain risk. But for procurement leaders like you, onboarding hundreds of suppliers every month with time pressure from your colleagues who really need access to these external tools and services, the task of managing supply chain risks has become nearly insurmountable as supply chains get larger and more complex. Now, here is the real problem. Those of you managing supply chain risks know that traditional methods suffer from two key drawbacks. First, they are slow and costly for both you and your suppliers. So they're not scalable beyond a small percentage of your supply chain. And they aren't easy to implement for those organizations who don't have the largest procurement budgets. You'll all be familiar with Word and spreadsheet questionnaires and endless email chains. Secondly, you will know more than me that traditional methods are not effective at actually reducing the risk 
or number of supply chain incidents over time, acting as more of a paper shield. Risk Ledger has been built to help you solve these key problems. The Risk Ledger platform enables procurement leaders at organizations of all sizes to run a comprehensive cybersecurity-led third-party risk management program across your entire supply chain, while cutting the time and cost per supplier of your program by up to 80% compared to those traditional methods. We have redefined the process by moving away from traditional point-in-time assessments to a continuous monitoring model, which allows organizations to quickly measure, identify, and reduce risk by gaining continuous visibility of the risk controls implemented by their third parties, as well as fourth, fifth, and sixth parties. More on that later on. Our platform operates like a network, providing the data pipe for organizations to share risk data between supplier and client. Clients can connect with all their suppliers in one place, while suppliers are able to share a single risk control profile with all of their clients to reduce their burden of work in a do once, use many model. This risk control profile includes a comprehensive set of ESG, procurement, financial, and cyber risks, and aligns with the ISO standard on supply chain management, the NIST framework, and it was developed with support from the National Cyber Security Center. The platform continuously monitors the status of each supplier's risk controls over time, eliminating the need for clients to repeat the review process annually. Every time a supplier connects with a new client, their risk control profile is reviewed again, creating a continuous commercial incentive for suppliers to maintain and improve their risk management regime over time. Organizations can be both a supplier and a client simultaneously on the platform. And we aim to connect every single organization on the globe in the supply chain ecosystem so that clients are able to actively detect I'm, and protect themselves I'm, from live supply I'm chain. I'm going to jump threat. in right now, Ashley. I can, I can feel you were coming to an end. Were you coming to an end? Well, I hope you were. I, I you am were. coming to an end. <laughs> right. Ashley, thank you so much. Welcome back, our judges. You, again, you've had a short break as well to kind of uh, absorb everything already. Let's hear from you about what you feel about Risk Ledger. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. My question is, what data are you using um, to create these assessments? And are you also practically reaching out to suppliers or is it more based on internet searches? Okay, so there's kind of two parts of that question. I'll take them, them separately. On the first question, the data is self-attested data from each of the suppliers. So they complete a profile on the risk ledger platform, and then they also upload evidence to showcase the risk control that they have in place. For example, if the um, control is about having um, a cybersecurity review from an external service, you want to see evidence, a certificate, or a report from that external service to prove that that happened. And then we don't use um, external data, um, but in the future, in phase, phase two of Risk Ledger, what we want to do is plug into technical controls that are able to verify that those risk controls are in place and also notify those um, uh, clients that you're connected with if there is an incident, going back to the active detecting and protecting of the supply chain. Thank you. Hey Ashley, thanks for the presentation. Could you share a bit more about maybe one or two examples of, of customers and, and the value that you've delivered for those folks and how you think about ROI of your product in general? Thanks. Absolutely, yeah. So um, I'm, I'm going to talk about one of the clients actually that are on screen at the moment. Um, so they um, have been particularly busy during the, the, the pandemic because they were they were set up to lead the UK's effort to uh, uh, to tackle the, um, uh, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And they have a vast supply chain that they, they need to uh, use to, to help them do that. But they also need to make sure that that supply chain is secure. They're effectively the largest health care startup in the UK in the last um, uh, year. And by onboarding onto the Risk Ledger platform, they were able to collect data from hundreds of their suppliers 
way quicker than they ever were able to um, with their previous method or any other competing methods. And there was actually a particular case of a supplier that was identified to not have adequate risk controls in place. These were cyber risk controls in place. And that was identified quickly. And they were able to talk, work with that supplier to improve their, um, uh, their sort of cybersecurity risk controls. And that really comes on to an important part, which is that the platform enables collaboration between clients and suppliers. It's not an audit. It's not something that suppliers should fear. It's a way for them, for clients to see what risk controls are in place and then work with their supply chain to improve that resilience, aiming towards our mission of making the whole supply chain ecosystem safer to work in. On the collaboration angle, you, um, you, I like this community uh, concept where you have one and then everybody can review the same uh, profile. Uh, and I also agree that it creates an incentive for keeping it updated. But do you use that data? So is it something that you actively use that to show that this has been reviewed by five or 10 or 20 other clients uh, within the last three months? I guess over time that can also build credibility around the the profile if you if you use that data actively. But uh, but but where are you on that? That's a, that's, a, that's a really good point, and I'll use an example. Actually, in the UK, nearly thirty percent of the water market is using Risk Ledger to manage risks in their supply chain because we're really applicable to critical national infrastructure organisations. So, in that example, where we have sort of four, five, actually six um, um, uh, uh, utility companies who are reviewing suppliers on the platform, in the future, when we build up that critical mass, that score where we can show uh, six of your um, uh, of organisations within in your industry have reviewed the supplier. It would be a, a, a real benefit. And it's something we have discussed already, but obviously it takes us to get to a critical mass for those numbers um, to make sense. So you're already seeing the kind of viral network effect that um, the I'm platform gonna jump enables. in just there. <laughs> you, can hear, you can hear me, got you. So just jumping <laughs> in there, again, just to make it fair and square. Ashley, thank you so much. We will hear tomorrow, if, if you're actually back on the screen with us as a winner this time. And, uh, and so good luck and uh, farewell London. <laughs> Hopefully. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right, we move on. Again, if you just joined us, remember this category here is the fourth category. We have five categories altogether. Remember, 10 big ideas, 10 different startups, all wanting to walk away a winner in their own respective category. This category here right now is risk and resilience. We've also already heard from Ashley in London with Risk Ledger. We move on to the next startup within the same category, Risk and Resilience, and we move across to Austria. In Austria, Preware is the name of the, uh, the startup, the company, and I believe Harold is ready and waiting. Harold, hi. Hi, Peter. Great to be with you today. How are you doing? Awesome. Looking so, out the sunny window you've got, in Vienna. You've got be a, so you have a sunny window in Vienna? Sunny view, at least. A sunny <laughs> view. So it may not be actually sun, I'm not sure whether there's a lot of sun in Vienna right now, but hey, we're here in, uh, as, you can, as you can see, it's a little bit gloomy, a little bit grey, but we're trying to brighten things up as much as we can with what you're about to say, our DJ and everybody else. Let's hear what you have to share. Four minutes is yours. Hi, everybody. My name is Harold and I'm co-founder of Prewave. And at Prewave, we use artificial intelligence to enable you to always stay one step ahead of critical risks in your supply chains. Supply chains have never been more complex and intransparent than they are today. And large corporations easily have thousands of suppliers distributed all around the world. But actually 90% of those corporations only use static and reactive approaches towards risk management. When onboarding a new supplier, they might look at financial credit reports, but those are typically based on last year's financial statements. Supplier self-assessments or on-site audits are also just snapshots and point-in-time information, and they fail to answer the one key question of supply chain risk management, and that is, what risks are really happening in your supply chain? Disruption risks like labor unrest or industrial accidents, but also ESG and sustainability risks like pollution or child labor. Now, lacking awareness around those serious issues can have consequences can lead to production stoppages, can lead to reputational damages, but also to penalties over recent supply chain acts. Now, the question still remains, how can you actually keep track of all of those risks in your supply chains? 
And at Prewave, we actually started working on those issues back in 2012 at the University of Technology Vienna. And the key insight for us came when we realized that the data is actually out there. And most of those critical issues in supply chains are actually represented in publicly available but highly localized data. And that is where Prewave comes in. Because at Prewave, we use artificial intelligence in order to analyze those publicly available but highly localized sources, social media, news media, blogs, in more than 50 plus languages, in order to predict those supply chain and sustainability risks that are relevant to your supply chain. Let me give an example. On the 17th of November, a supplier of one of our customers went bankrupt. On the 14th of September, so more than two months in advance, we were able to send the first risk alert to a customer, warning them that the supplier has just had their bank accounts frozen by a regulatory agency in China. A few days later, the employees of that supplier complain on Weibo, a Chinese social media platform, that they haven't been paid wages for the last weeks. The supplier eventually goes bankrupt, but at this point, no longer to the surprise of our customer, saving them a lot of time, money, and headaches. Now at Prewave, we cover the full spectrum of supply chain risks. And since 2019, we've been working with the Volkswagen Group, monitoring more than 5,000 of their tier one suppliers, but also mapping and monitoring thousands of their tier N suppliers in 16 critical raw materials. And the results truly speak for themselves. According to a benchmarking conducted by one of our leading customers, we were able to identify 95% of those critical issues that were facing the supply chain. And 50% of those we were able to predict well in advance of any other sources they had at their disposal, both internal and external. Today, we have more than 16 employees working at Prewave, and more than two thirds of them are still data science engineers and developers. We have many well known and happy paying customers. We have onboarded more than 50,000 suppliers already and have more than 2,500 active users. And our customers are not just happy but they also like to speak about it. And that makes us happy. So if you would also like to be one step ahead of risks in your supply chain, then let's get in touch, head over to prewave.com, sign up and book a demo. Thank you very much. Harold, well done. From sunny Vienna to, uh, to our judges. Let's hear from our, our jury members and, uh, and let's hear if you're making them happy. Let's hear. <laughs> Harold, how do you look at information overload? So if you scan all social media sources, so both overload, but also credibility. So how, how do you, what does it take to trigger, for example, Facebook updates or whatever it could be? Yeah, great question. I mean, when people ask us, how can I have been working on this problem for nine years already? Then there's two answers. First of all, it's the language coverage. But on the other hand, it's precisely this issue. And alerting an early warning system only works when the relationship of how many alerts you actually send versus how relevant they are works in the favor uh, of the customer. And that is what we've been able to achieve. And um, I think the benchmarking results of our customers also demonstrate that. But can you talk a bit more to the intelligence uh, around what, what, what is it? Is it the volume? Is it the credit? You know, what drives it? If we look at one step deeper. Absolutely, there's two, there's two steps. Uh, to that process. First step is identifying the signal from the noise. What's actually relevant? Is somebody saying, I'm on my way to work and my car is striking, or I'm not going to work today because we are on strike. Yeah. But then the second step is clustering together similar posts. Yeah. So we don't send you one alert for one single tweet, but rather we understand that for a labor strike, there's dozens of tweets and dozens of YouTube videos and dozens of posts, and you receive only one targeted alert from Prewave. And that's how you reduce from a lot of signal, uh, from a lot of noise to very targeted signals you get from Prewave. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harold, for your presentation. I have two questions. So first of all, how do you differentiate um, compared to other solutions like Bureau van Dijk? Um, and second question would be, do you simply um, analyze or do you also send alerts and potentially even recommendations? Mm -hmm. So to the first question, our key differentiator is our technology edge. Now, the ability to process highly localized sources in the local languages, that's precisely what gives us this focus on early warnings and predictions. Back to the benchmarking I showed earlier today, 50% of risks we alerted our customers on were before they received any other source. 
internally or externally. And that is a key differentiator that we've been working on for nine years. Um, to the second point, um, we are building now analytics on top of the data. Yeah? We just released our 360 degree, degree risk score, which enables you to, based on the data we were able to identify globally, you can categorize, classify, and rank your suppliers according to that. And that is the, the next step we are taking also already with a few on the upcoming supply chain due diligence legislation in Germany and the European Union. Thank you. Hey, Harold, um, thanks for the presentation. Could you share a bit more about, you know, in a year or two or, or maybe even five years time, what, what does pre-wave look like then? Where are you heading? You just mentioned risk scoring, but can you share more about the vision for the company? Absolutely. So right now we have a very strong foothold in the automotive but electronics industry. We would like to expand that to all the other industries that are also in severe need of more transparency around risks in their supply chains. Not just disruptions, but particularly ESG and sustainability risks. But if we go more than, let's say, five years into the future, I think Prewave should also be a system that is not just uh, a few for corporations into the transparency of supply chains, but also eventually for consumers yeah, who are becoming more and more aware around which of the companies offering products are actually more sustainable or not. And that is, let's say, the longer term view of Prewave opening up not just B2B, but also B2C. I think that's it. We've got seven seconds, six seconds on the clock. Uh, Harold, talking about five years into the future, I'm just concerned about tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll find out whether we bring you back or not a little bit later on tomorrow on screen to see if your winner of this category may even be the winner, the, the overall winner of the audience. Harold, thank you so much and uh, enjoy sunny Vienna. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Bye-bye. <laughs> Right, as you can hear, it's getting tougher and tougher and so tough to decide, again, that overall winner, which we want you to do when all, it is, all of this is finished. We've just got one more category to go through. Once we've done that, we'll ask you once again to vote for your, for your favourite, your overall winner. It's a tough call. I wouldn't like to be in your shoes. You're, that is, you are in those shoes, and we'd love you to, to give your vote a little bit later on. Right, moving on now to category, and the last category, category number five. Right, so this last category is a category that, uh, that I'm sure means a lot to, to a lot of people, uh, um, completely relevant right now, more than ever, and that actually is sustainability. Sustainability, really looking at tech that, that really innovates sustainable procurement activities as a supply chain as a whole, from carbon emissions to, to human rights. So again, I'm, I'm intrigued as much as everybody else, really, to hear these ideas and, uh, and see the, 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 the real problems and the solutions they've got to these problems. Right, so we go over now to a place we've already been so far, and that's to the UK. And I believe we have Douglas with us. Hi, Douglas. Hey, how are you? Nice to see you again, Peter. Lovely to see you. Where are you in the UK? Just, just give us a bit of a flavour where you are right now. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in West London, which, of course, is a little bit grey, perhaps just like Amsterdam is today. Well, it is. But you know what? Together, we're going to try and brighten things up as much as we can. Douglas, four minutes are yours. Thank you. And um, hello, everybody. And um, I'm Doug johnson Pernsgan. I'm, I'm Chief Exec and Co-Founder of, of Circular. Before we started Demo 2021, about an hour ago, we were hearing from the chief exec of Echo Vardis, and he, he said right at the end that 80% of all global carbon emissions are accounted for by the supply chain. Now, you know, the reality is that making things that we as consumers buy creates an awful lot of carbon. Why? Because the energy invested in turning, for example, rock into cars or even phones. Um, or, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, textiles or food industry or all the global logistics. And, and, and that is probably the defining problem of our age. That's what we solve. We, Circular, are the superpower behind some of the world's biggest brands. You can see a lot of car manufacturers on here, but also upstream producers like Total um, and also BHP, the world's largest mining company. 
where we are supporting them to follow materials through their supply chains to attribute um, a slice of CO2 emissions to that flow of materials. And the reason is you can't manage something you cannot measure. So um, what are we doing? Well, we're creating a digital twin for a commodity source. This could be recycled material or it could be material directly from mine sites and following that material as it goes through the supply chain until it becomes your iPhone or my EV. Uh, and the challenge, of course, is that what comes out of a mine site is rock and what we buy, an iPhone or an EV, completely different. So you have to be able to follow materials through industrial processes of refining and smelting and, and amalgamation with other materials before they become sub components and, uh, and go into assemblies into, for example, an electric vehicle. We've been doing that successfully now for nearly four years um, and attributing now a, a, a slice of ESG metrics, predominantly carbon, but increasingly things like water use or human rights data to that flow of materials. And we're taking data directly from supply chain participants, augmenting it with information that we can get from third party sources, which could be auditors or certifiers, or sometimes you know, observations from aerial imagery, we're using machine vision for that, um, in order to build trust through these very, very complex global industrial supply chains. Um, the key thesis behind this, of course, is that information or data is, is the crucial enabler both of net zero and also the circular economy. You can't have a circular economy if you don't know where stuff is and what its state is um, if you want, for example, to be able to recycle successfully. Um, now, all of that might sound very complicated, but to the user, this ultimately comes down to the creation of actionable insight. Um, and obviously, I'm speaking to an audience here of procurement professionals. In my view, procurement and supply chain management are the cheapest and easiest tool that large corporations have got to decarbonize. Basically, buy smarter, but you can't buy smarter without greater insight. Um, and that's before the organization spends billions on R&D to invent new materials and find other ways in which to do things. I showed you some of the brands that we're working with at the very start of this presentation, um, and, and all of them are now on multi-year contracts with us, which has led us to the position we as a company are in today. We're today the dominant solution provider in the EV battery space, both upstream all the way through the supply chain to downstream car manufacturers and the very strong network effects because the battery manufacturers are used by a whole variety of participants in both consumer electronics and also in, um, in cars. Approaching 10 million of ARR this year, um, and we didn't raise any money until we were self-funding. Um, so long, long journey, but um, so far on a mission to try and drive adjacencies into other markets. With that, my challenge. With that, I'm gonna. I don't have to stop you there because you've you've done it already. You you just in time, Douglas. Right. Let's move over to our jury members. Let's let's hear again a gentleman now, right in London, very close, so so close to each other. Um, over to you. <laughs> hey, Doug, thank you for the presentation. Could you share Hi. a bit more about when a new enterprise customer comes on board with Circular, how they get up and running? How does the implementation work for your solution? Yeah, so um, I mean, the first step of a journey like this, of course, is supply chain mapping. Um, and sometimes the, 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 the manufacturer has done that, sometimes they've not, but we can do it with them. In many cases, large proportions of their supply chain, particularly if you're looking at something like batteries, we're already, we're already doing. So, so we can often help them with that. Um, the process of onboarding individual suppliers is about agreeing with them an API integration um, to their production management or quality management system to capture data between goods in and goods out and information about key ESG metrics. Um, average time between four and six weeks. Well, thank you very much. My question will be, what are your extension plans to other industries? Yeah, so we're already working on projects in um, the chemical recycling of plastic waste. Um, so we just finished a project with Total Energies on that. Plastic taxes, of course, are already a thing in Europe, uh, demonstrating not only the responsible collection of ocean-bound plastic, but also um, the level of recycled content through um, continuous distillation processes. We just finished a project with Jaguar Land Rover on leather traceability from cow to car. The point I'm making is there are a whole mountain of um, complex industrial supply chains where the same method can be applied, but we decided to start with something very specific um, and get good at it and win our reputation there. Thanks. 
in terms of facilitating that uh, that collaboration or traceability, of course, visibility into potential problems is one thing. Uh, but but how do you see you contributing to the solution? And not to say that creating that visibility is not part of that, but um, but but what's coming next uh, on your roadmap? Well, what's coming right now to your question, how does this drive action? Um, I mentioned buying smarter as a key tool. So Polestar has just committed to create a net zero car by 2030, citing us as one of the key tools for doing it. And that means helping them understand which parts of their supply chain they should seek to swap out as a way of materially um, decreasing the inherited carbon that they get from their supply chain. Others are doing the same thing now. Where does this go eventually? Well, the amount of data that we're starting to collect in the supply chains in which we work across multiple supply chain participants is very, very significant, giving us a level of insight which you know, existing uh, data providers like IHS Market and Automotive are very, very keen to gain access to. So there are many ways to monetize this data beyond actually helping the supply chain participants themselves. In terms of funding, you also said you were self-funding uh, up until 2020, and then you raised the money. And I, and I think you said you would use that to open up uh, offices in a few other places. But what else will you spend those money on in terms of the product? Well, so broadly speaking, two thirds going into sales and marketing, including obviously in different markets. Joe Biden has just signed executive orders around things like resource security and sustainability, which we're piggybacking off the back of in the US market. You noticed Boeing was one of the the, 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 uh, the brands that we had on there. Um, the other one, of course, is continual evolution of the, the product portfolio. Um, you know, our, we believe that our best defense is to innovate faster than people that are attempting to copy some of what we do. Seconds on the clock, enough time for a quick question, a quick answer. Or in fact, Douglas, if you want to say something for 10 seconds, go for it. Yeah, I mean, this is the defining challenge of our age. And if we collectively cannot see into tier end of our supply chain, we're not going to solve it. <laughs> what a way to finish. Right, Douglas, thank you so much. Uh, good luck. And uh, with any luck, maybe, maybe, just maybe we'll see you again tomorrow. But this time, but, but tomorrow as actually a winner. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Again, if you've just joined us, remember this is Demo 2021, a startup pitching competition all about showcasing the, the, the disruptive emerging talent and ideas and concepts within the procurement industry. We have five categories. This is the fifth one, so it's almost done, almost finished. This is actually the, the sustainability category. We've just heard from Douglas with Circular. Now we move on to our very last startup of the competition within this category, and that is actually Lewis with Surplus. I think Lewis is there. Hi, hi Lewis. Hi, Peter. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing well, very well. How are you doing? Where are you right now? I'm great. I'm in Berlin right now. I think it's just started raining, but uh, other than that, we have a <laughs> last uh, Just summer. started raining. What a, what a great phrase to start off your pitch. But hey, hopefully you can turn that into some sunshine and, and even maybe a rainbow at the end. Right. Let's hear it from, uh, from you, Lewis. Four minutes are yours. Thank you, Peter. So as mentioned, I'm Lewis Geiselhardt. I'm the product owner for Surplus. And today I'm going to talk to you about recycled plastics. Our world actually is drowning in plastics. Every year, 15 million tons of it reach into our oceans. And this is nothing new. We all know what plastics is doing to our planet. The pressure truly is on. We also all know that recycled plastics is the way to go. But here's the thing. For those of you in the industry, you know that recycled plastics is a really complex market. And consequently, only 7% of produced plastics is recycled. And why is it actually so difficult? Well, here's why. The market is super fragmented. In Europe alone, there are more than 1,200 recyclers, all of them with their individual own products. So very important thing to notice, recycled plastics are not a commodity, unlike virgin plastics. Second of all, in this industry, we still see Wild West business practices. There's a lack of trust. And underlying all of this, there's a lack of standards. And last but not least, it is not digital. So we see most procurement processes still happening analog resulting in inefficient and ineffective processes. The good thing is, the good news is the tide is turning. So we see increased consumer and regulatory pressure, basically forcing the market to use more recycled plastic in their products. This in turn results in a huge projected increase in the market in the future. 
And in this environment, we are building surplus, the marketplace to make it really easy and cost efficient to buy and sell recycled plastics online. Now I said before, trust is super important, especially for any kind of business transaction. And this is why at Surplus, we are investing heavily into trust. And we want to be and will be the first credible marketplace for recycled plastics with things such as verification of suppliers, and response rate, response time, before we heard already reviews and ratings, it's really important, especially also when it comes to B2B. The other pillar of this trust is basically, I mentioned it, a lack of standard. We actually, a surplus, we have been spearheading and co-developing the new DIN spec 91446, and this is truly revolutionary in the industry. For the first time, there will be a tool, this DIN spec, to bridge the communication gap between plastic converters and recyclers when they talk about material quality. In the end, we will, or we expect this to basically enable a much, much higher supply of high quality recyclers, which right now are in decreasing or increasing rather demand. Now, I mentioned that the market is really fragmented and what makes more sense than building a marketplace where you can aggregate supply and demand and consequently make it really easy and straightforward to discover qualities, quantities and prices on our marketplace as shown in this little video right here. However, we are not just a marketplace. We are building out more and more parts of the procurement process on our platform. As you can see, you can you know, request a sample, you can request a quote, and step by step, the entire process of procurement will be integrated in the platform, making it one seamless and secure user experience. And the numbers show that we are doing something right. Since our inception in 2020, we have onboarded more than 900 companies to our platform, and they have brought more than 1 million tons of inventory. And I'm proud to say that this number has doubled in the last four months alone. We also have onboarded industry giants such as Procter & Gamble successfully to our platform. This is the most important part. Two things we do for or against rather the climate change problem. We give plastic waste a higher value, thereby increasing its usage. And for every ton of recycled plastic used, 80% of CO2 can be saved. Now I want to leave you with the vision for Surplus, which is to become the one-stop shop for circular plastics by integrating more and more pieces of the recycled plastics value chain into our platform. Thank you very much. I'm leaving you with these two CTAs. Um, I'm gonna, we are people. I, I, right. I, I, stop right, right, I'm going to have to st <laughs> stop you right there. Okay, let's hear for the very last time from our jury members about what they've just heard. So thanks for that. I very much agree that it's a real problem with, uh, with plastic pollution. Um, but in order for this to work, there has to be a solid commercial model around it. Could you talk a bit about how do you uh, intend to make this a good investment for your investors? What's the commercial model uh, and how far are you in rolling that out? Yeah, you're like right on the dollar with this question. Thank you. <laughs> it's a tough one. Um, until now, we are free completely. So the second point in the slide is really, I mean it, go now register for free. But what are we going to do? Of course, we have several ways of how you can basically monetize such a business. The one is that you go for a SaaS subscription. The other is you have like a membership fee or you can do transactional uh, fees. And we will test out all of them in the coming, well, this quarter and also next year, obviously. But it is on our agenda very much at the top. <clears throat> and um, at this moment, I cannot tell you much more than that. But of course, it's it's a key topic that we are, you know, facing, and it's on our it's on our very highest priority, basically. One of the challenges of of any marketplace, be it B two B or B two C, is is getting both sides of the marketplace going at the same time. Can you speak a bit more about how you are encouraging people to join the marketplace? and what it means in terms of onboarding, just to, to bring it to life? Yeah, that's also another really good question, the typical uh, chicken and egg problem. Um, initially, at Surplus, we focused on the supply side because we figured once you have the supply, since, you know, but also even that is changing, the demand will come when the supply is there and vice versa. This can also be true, but we first focused uh, on the supply side. Then we switched to focus once we realized, okay, there's now quite um, a, a bit of supply on Surplus. We addressed in our marketing efforts um, the demand side more, let's say, aggressively focused on them. Um, 
The onboarding basically is different for suppliers and buyers in the sense that as a supplier, naturally, you will have material that you want to bring onto a platform. We support you in that. We make it as easy as possible for you. And I would say that on average, also, you probably want to show a bit more how trustworthy you are than a buyer. Although that being said, even a buyer in this industry, I mentioned before, we have Wild West business practices. As a supplier, you also want to know that this buyer is actually trustworthy in case something goes wrong, which happens a lot, given that, once more, it's not a commodity. So long story short, um, we are now basically in, a, I would say, a good equilibrium, more or less. Um, we see a lot of demand and we expect even more, especially in the, the upcycling segment that we want to um, help develop, as I mentioned, in the context of the DIN spec as well. Um, so in the future... I think we always will have to go back and forth between the two sides and see where we have an overhang or you know, not enough. So from a user experience, buyers would uh, want to go to a one-stop shop where they, have, um, they can buy everything, basically. So what are your plans to integrate um, your marketplace into existing ERP solutions? <laughs> yeah, that's another really good question. And we are thinking about that as well. Is something that we want to test out as well in the, I would say, coming quarters. Um, it is the question we're asking ourselves basically is this. Will companies come to surplus and do the entire procurement there while they have their own systems? And the answer to that will remain to be seen. But as we saw before, there are plenty of ideas how we can integrate into existing systems and we will try them out um, in a small scale and see if this, you know, turns the tide if this is what is needed for people or for companies rather to have it even easier to use surplus. Um, also, there are models that we see in the market that don't do this, that they, they are successful just pulling the companies onto their platform. And I think this is something that could potentially also work in this market because the reason we are here is it is not digital, right? So if there's someone that provides this, being digital and having the market attached to it, it's you know, a bit of a no-brainer. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you there, Luis. Thank you so much. Uh, hopefully, maybe, just maybe, it's a question mark at the moment, maybe we'll see you again tomorrow, but not in the form of, of just a, a, a picture, but in the form of maybe a winner. We'll wait and see. Thank you so much, Luis, and, uh, and farewell. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, guys. Wonderful. Right. Guess what? We have come to the end, almost at the end of Demo 2021 for this year. But before, before we actually move on to the audience vote, where you get a chance to, to give us your opinion and tell us who you feel should walk away a winner, we have to, all of us, th say thank you to Will, Jacob and Miriam, our judges. Bring them up on the screen. I just want to say a, a warm thank you to, to all of you. you you gave up your time, you gave up your energy, you gave up your, uh, your, uh, your expertise as well. It's not easy. It's not easy for, for, for audience members looking in and listening to pitches here and there. You listen to every single word. Thank you so much.